So hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our HashiCorp webinar, where today we'll be talking about how to manage secrets in OpenShift containers with HashiCorp Vault. My name is Connor Beechnall, Senior Field Marketing Manager here at HashiCorp, and today I'm joined by our Senior Solutions Engineer, Robert Gustafsson, as well as Nicholas Ehrman, Staff Solutions Engineer here at HashiCorp, and they'll be your presenters today. In terms of the agenda, we'll start with a summary showing exactly what Vault is, as well as some common use cases, and then we'll show you the benefits of using Vault with OpenShift. Then to wrap up, we'll have a live Q&A session at the end, so please submit any of your questions via the Q&A box provided, and we'll answer those at the end of the session. Please note that this webinar is being recorded, and we'll send everyone a copy via email after it's been processed, usually within a day or two. So with that, over to you, Robert. Thanks, Connor. So um, shortly about HashiCorp. Um, the company was founded in 2012 by uh, Mitchell Hashimoto and Armand Dadgar. The first kind of three years was all put on R&D. We have six different solutions. They're all available as open source. Uh, Vagrant is a solution for building repeatable development environment. And Pactor is a tool that is commonly used for building your virtual machine images. These two are only available as, as free tools and the other ones we have commercial offerings around. Um, and we're gonna discuss Vault today. Um, we also have, I mean, kind of a model where we use the full stack uh, to provide benefits around uh, using multi-cloud. So basically, if you want help with having going all the way from developing your application until having your app running on a securely provisioned on infrastructure securely on basically any cloud or even on-premise clouds. Uh, we have a full stack that can support you with that. And we call this the cloud operating model. And uh, the white paper is available for, for download and I strongly recommend having a look at that. So let's go deeper into Vault. Um, before we move into the more OpenShift stuff, we kind of want to give a baseline for everyone where we stand around Vault. Um, so Vault is a secrets management broker. This means that if you have a client, whether this would be a person, or an application or a system, it would reach out to Vault to get access to specific secrets. Uh, Vault then would uh, authenticate that client against a third party authentication service, whether this would be Active Directory, some of the IAM cloud providers authentication services. And as soon as the client is authenticated, a token would be created and returned to the client. That token can grant access to Vault uh, for the specific client. And uh, on top of that, we would put policies in place, access controllers of what specific uh, secrets this uh, client could see. And the whole workflow here, both at rest and in flight, is encrypted and secure. So it gives you very, I mean, solid foundation of handling your secrets management in this environment. Um, some common criteria among most of our products, especially around Vault, is everything is API driven, API first. So anything can be codified, automated, uh, through the RESTful API. We also have a CLI and we also have a graphical user interface. Uh, and those has features that make sense depending on if you want to use terminal or if you uh, are a human user that is looking at the screen basically. Uh, we also support a lot of different identities, whether this would be the, your public cloud identities, your, your container environment or something else. We also integrate with a lot of we kind of have pre-built plugins to integrate with a lot of different services and applications so we can generate, generate user credentials for these different services. Uh, and that, that brings a lot of power to Vault to be able to be the kind of centralized management for not only applications, but also services. If we look at the Vault enterprise, so some of you might be familiar with what the Vault, Vault open source version. It's just a binary that you download. Uh, the Vault enterprise share the same code base, but it has, uh, on top of that, it has more features. Um, so the base kind of platform that you can consume when it comes to Vault enterprise is the Vault enterprise platform. Uh, it offers 
DR basically to ensure that you have a copy of your cluster. It also offer namespacing, which, which we're going to discuss a bit deeper. Uh, on top of that, you can pick and choose between different modules depending on what your needs are. Uh, we have the multi data and scale data center and scale, which you're going to touch a, bit, a little bit upon. When it comes to horizontal scaling and having uh, geographical coverage of glo globally, basically. Uh, governance and policy, which gives you kind of more control. Uh, you can write policy as code uh, and more granularity on, on how you handle uh, your different users from a governance perspective. Uh, and we also have the advanced data protection, which is fairly new. It was uh, somewhat released here in April, and I'm going to go deeper into that as well. So, Vault key principles and features. Um, Vault is running basically in memory. Uh, you have a lot of, uh, or you have a cluster that is running Vault, uh, and it will have some kind of storage backend. Um, for Vault to be able to operate, you need to decrypt the storage backend. The way that it is done is you have a master key, and then can, that can decrypt the, the storage key that can basically uh, decrypt the storage backend. Um, when it comes to the enterprise version, we support uh, integrated storage, which is built on Raft, which is running on the Vault instances. And we also support console, which is a redundant key value store that uh, we support as well. So we have a manual process of doing an unseal, which means that we split, in, split the master key uh, into uh, chunks and uh, we give those to people. And these people, we will have a quorum that is required to be able to unseal Vault, basically. We can also automate this process by using some uh, cloud key management solutions or an, an HS, HSM for the on-premise uh, environment. So. Another part here, as we discussed, uh, when you authenticate against Vault, you, you get a token that gets access to secrets. Uh, these tokens will have a time to live, which gives you full control over uh, how long a specific uh, authenticated user should have access to its secrets. This token can also be revoked at any time, which gives you very good control of, of who has access to the secrets and if you suddenly need to revoke access for some reason. Uh, the dynamic secrets part is basically if you want to offer uh, short-lived credentials for specific systems that are rotated automatically over time. Um, and these can also have least time, so access can be automatically uh, removed when the lease, is, lease expires. Another important feature for most of our more, I mean, financial institutions that are running uh, Vault uh, would be audit logging. Uh, this means that any action that is taken against Vault uh, will be uh, logged. Uh, and this can be available for your law the indexing tool like Splunk or Elasticsearch or something, so you can correlate the logging across your full environment. Um, Vault, to be able to operate, it requires two methods of logging. Uh, we have three options. You can do it by socket, you can do it by file, you can do it by syslog. And two of these need to be operational to be, for Vault to be able to operate. Uh, and this has to do with to avoid tampering across uh, this, basically. So when it comes to high availability, so Vault is a cluster. Uh, I mean, we normally recommend having a minimum of, of three instances running. If you would run this on cloud and would want to use high availability, we would suggest stretching this, these across three availability zones. Um, one of them will be a leader. And if you lose a zone, in that case, a new leader will be elected and you can still continue to operate. Um, we have refer reference architectures. Uh, available publicly if you want to look in deeper to this and there's different reference architecture depending if you, what kind of if you want to use console as a storage backend and or if you want to use integrated storage on top of this when you have your high available vault you might want to consider having a dr set up as well dr can protect you against some kind of failure or tampering with your primary cluster even have its own master key as well, so that even protects you against losing, for some reason, your, your, your master key for your primary cluster. The secondary cluster will be um, passive in this respect, so it, and it, it can handle longer latency, so it can be in another region rather than just in, in another availability zone. 
so when we came to the um, the replication part, uh, if you're looking for having like a global regional kind of access to vault across maybe different clouds, on-premise data centers, you might want to consider having local cluster on each site and having replicated uh, your secrets across all clusters. We have a feature called performance replicas, uh, which, uh, or performance replication that enables that. Performance replicas is basically adding um, non-voting members so you can have uh, you can extend your clusters for for read capabilities as well is part of this uh, uh, bundle but generally this offers you for customers that are globally active you can have clusters across the globe whether this would be in the us europe china and you can have low latency access to your secrets all of this um, will be in an active active access um, capability uh, and you can also scale this horizontally by adding more cluster, clusters as well. When it comes to namespaces, um, if you're familiar with open source Vault, you only have one flat namespace. Uh, if you want to run Vault in a larger environment, you might have different teams that want to have their own Vault, but you want to centralize the operations around Vault because uh, it can be, uh, I mean, in the end, if you're using Vault as a centralized secrets management tool, it requires to be fully online, highly available and all of that. So you might want to have centralized operations, but you still want to give uh, developers or users like their own Vault where they can have, have admin access. So you can segment Vault, basically providing multi-tenancy within Vault to your different teams through namespaces. So let's discuss a few of the use cases you can use Vault for. So secrets as a service, basically having a centralized way of securing your secrets across your organization. One of the first steps that many customers takes is just replacing their spreadsheet of passwords or, or the, the note that they have on the wall, adding the secrets to kind of a key value store within Vault so that you can share your secrets in a good way across your organization. The next step could be to use dynamic secrets. So basically having um, short-lived credentials across your organizations that kind of limit the surface of attack for specific applications. And of course, then you can control even further by having access control list that defines what specific client can see what specific secrets. And on top of that, you have the token list to enforce for how long specific users should be, uh, have access to these secrets. Um, in April, we released support for KMIP, uh, which is a uh, stands for Key Management uh, Interoperability Protocol. This gave us the possibility to integrate with a lot of different vendors when it comes to being a key management servers for their encryption capabilities. So for example, if you wanna encrypt your, your, uh, your NetApp storage system, your MongoDB database, or your VMs on VMware, uh, th then uh, you have the option of, of using Vault as the KMS backend of, of that encryption capability. Uh, my colleague Nicholas did most of the work, as far as I understand, on actually getting uh, the, the VMR part ready, and that was uh, is in the support matrix since two weeks ago. Uh, we also released the Transform Secret Engine, and this is normally referred to as tokenization. What it means that we can do format format pers preserving encryption. So basically examples here in the Nordics, we have our personal numbers or possibly a credit card number that is stored in a database with the specific format. Um, with this feature, we can actually encrypt and, and keep the formatting so you can store it in the database. This would ensure that the data is safe even if someone uh, compromises your database, uh, for example, or if you have an, an outsourced database service provider in that case, they couldn't even read your access without, re read the, the information without decrypting it through Vault and being authenticated. Another part here is of course that handle uh, the SSH certificates. Uh, Vault can act as a certificate authority, authority to SSH. It can be very difficult to handle this in, in larger environments. So this gives you a centralized way of uh, management around your SSH certificate. And uh, you can also use this within different um, 
secrets engine to isolate different environments to get kind of multi tendency across uh, SSA secrets as, as well across your environment. Another common use case is PKI as a service. Basically, Vault can act as your intermediate authority, which means that we could be the the closest thing to, to create new um, certificates for your secure communications, for example, your TLS certificate. Uh, we can automate the generation, but also handling the rotation over time, which can be pretty complex, especially in a very dynamic environment or if you're using something like containers where you're going to automate the whole process. Also, I'm just going to touch on this because uh, Nicholas is, is going to go deeper in, into this specific area with, with OpenShift. Uh, but we can also help by securing your container environment. Uh, we can use the Kubernetes auth message to, auth, uh, to authenticate uh, against Vault. Uh, on top of that, we can automate the token creation uh, by using service counts. So your applications can easily use the JWT token to get access to their specific secrets through Vault. Another part here is we have the not so long ago released uh, sidecar injector, which means it's very easy to inject secrets to your pods. And with that, I would like to hand over to Nicholas so he'll go deeper into the OpenShift part. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so do you see my screen? Everything's fine? Yes. Yes? Okay, cool. So thank you, Robert, for that uh, introduction and uh, overview of Vault. And now we are going to get in a little bit deeper on why Vault is the perfect companion of uh, OpenShift deployments. And, um, you know, what, what does it mean in terms of uh, what we support? How do we install it? How do we work with, with OpenShift? And what are the benefits? Ah, sorry. It was too quick. So the first thing is, as soon as you have to work with Kubernetes or, or OpenShift, you see that you have like opportunities to create secrets and manage secrets inside uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift. But as soon as you start to use it in production, you see that as uh, secrets are in fact a base64 encoded. So that was the first way of creating uh, secrets inside OpenShift. And you say, okay, it's base64. So from any kind of uh, laptop or even a Raspberry Pi, you can you know, decode the secrets because base64 is not a very strong, I would say, a cipher algorithm to, to, to protect my secrets. So, okay, so you say, whatever, I can use the airbag systems inside Red Hat OpenShift to say only few people can have access to uh, the secrets. So yes, okay, but as soon as you give the opportunity to people to connect to and to have access and to read the secrets, you say you have an opportunity for uh, secret sprawls or a secret leak, more secret leaks than secret sprawl. I'm gonna go through the secret sprawl afterwards, but you have a secret leak in, in terms of, if someone can read the secrets, you can be pretty sure that that person could extract the secrets and give that secrets to someone else. Even if it's not a bad intention, you know, it's just because we are human, <laughs> we like to share things. And when we know something, we, can, we like to say, hey, I know that. Do you know the new gossip or whatever? So that was also an issue. But then again, they, we started to create and to had like encryption at rest with ETCD and the support of that on Kubernetes and OpenShift. But even that, it's only encryption at rest. That means if someone stole the disk, it can't read the secrets. But if you have access to that secret, you can still read the secret because probably you have access to the key. And if you have access to the key, which is again, a base 64 encrypted key, you can have again access to and decrypt, in fact, uh, probably all the secrets or 
some secrets. So the thing is, we're with Vault and OpenShift, what we want to achieve, because OpenShift, that's, that's the things of, of OpenShift. They, we want to automate everything. We want to, um, we want to give the opportunity to, to the developers to don't care, to doesn't care of uh, the secrets. Why? Because it doesn't have to know the secrets. It doesn't have to manage the secrets. As a security uh, or as an admin platform um, in, on OpenShift, you don't want to deal with uh, as the support of the secrets and the security of the systems. Of course, you put the security recommendation on your OpenShift, but managing secrets is quite different. So to avoid that, and we wrote some papers uh, uh, in, in joint uh, in uh, with Red Hat. So we said, okay, so we have uh, we have a solution called Vault, and we have an integration with uh, authentication based on Kubernetes service account token. So why you don't use that? You know to externalize all the secrets outside the etcd platform on OpenShift, and use a real solution where you have audits, where you have. Uh, real airbag systems are really, um, you know, built for security where you have uh, identity authentication methods, where you have a, also a dynamic secret generation. That's what we want to provide, in fact, with, um, with the integration with OpenShift. So to do that, uh, as I said, we have different way of integrating Vault with OpenShift. And the first one is to use the authentication method of, uh, of the service account. So for instance, in any project that you have in OpenShift, you can create a service account for your own, uh, for your own pods inside uh, the project. And because you can use that service account and mount the token of that specific service account, you can give access to Vault. And Vault, when you try to identify the pod with a specific uh, ID, a token from the service account, Vault will go, will go through the Kubernetes API to ensure that the proper identity that comes from the proper pods and you have the right access, okay? As soon as Vault validates the identity that you provide through the service, token, through the service account, Vault will give access to a subset of a secret engine. So it could be static, could be dynamic, and you know you don't have to deal again with uh, with the secrets. Everything will be managed centrally inside inside Vault. So that's the main purpose of the of the thing. Uh, if you think about what Robert said uh, just a few minutes ago, we we can deliver uh, major use cases. One of the biggest one, for instance, is the way to automate as uh, a generation of uh, PKI or SSL certificates to ensure that you have a proper configuration on all the routes that you are uh, configuring on Red Hat OpenShift. Most of the time, what we told um, on the customer is first, they use self-sign. That's very bad because it's self-sign certificate. It's not really secure. Or they use the wildcard certificate. Why? Because it's easier because it's not easy to uh, programmatically uh, create certificates for specific uh, routes, for a specific service. So they use a white card and it's not very secure. You can see exactly the same thing for, um, for instance, when you want to deploy a pod and it's in, uh, inside the application, so in your project, you have a pod for a front end and you have a pod for the back end which is a MongoDB or PostgreSQL or an, another kind of, um, of, uh, of database. So first things first, when you have to deal with that, you have to create the secrets, inject the secrets in the pod to connect to the database, okay? That's the first thing that you have to do if you don't use that kind of integration. But here we want to go further in terms of uh, security inside, inside OpenShift and inside your application. What we want to achieve here with that kind of integration is to say, okay, I want to create a dynamic username and password for my MongoDB every time I start my pods. And if I kill the pods, I want to remove this, that specific secrets. And that's something that we can achieve with uh, integration with Vault. And 
that's something that just you know uh, starts uh, that uh, move me to to the next slide is the fact that you know we have a pretty tight integration with OpenShift. So of course, and I'm going to go through that afterwards on how to deploy Vault and what do we provide in terms of integration. But the first one is okay. I already have a Vault because um, I already use Vault for NC Vault to go to uh, help secure my SSH access to my servers. I already use Vault for uh, KMIP on VMware because I have a VMware running. <clears throat> Uh, inside my data centers. Or I use Vault also in AWS uh, because I'm using uh, EC2 instances and I want to bring them uh, dynamic access to database or even KV, KV uh, secrets that I have. So here with OpenShift and Kubernetes, what we provide is a full integration with some things that we call an injector. So what does it provide? First, bec before that, we had, we didn't have like uh, very good integration, I would say, because we had to use init containers and sidecar containers uh, with a specific core commands or specific, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms that we had to put inside uh, the, the, the init container and sidecar container to integrate with Vault. But now with, uh, we, ha we have that since more than three months, I think, um, even more than that. You can use some things that we call Vault for Kubernetes, and it will deploy some things that we call an injector. And the injector will be used to automatically inject sidecar and init containers when you use specific annotation on your uh, pods deployment. So in your in your YAML file, you use uh, annotation to say, "I need that secret. I need an init container. I need." Uh, I need a sidecar because it's a long running uh, application. So I need to renew my token or I need to renew my, my secrets uh, because I need to change it. So everything will be uh, taken in charge by the injector uh, through the, some things that we call mutating webhook inside Kubernetes. It's not something that we develop. We are just using it uh, for the integration and that makes life way, way, way easier for developers. Because instead of, you know, thinking about, okay, what, what do I need? What do I want? Uh, maybe sometimes they don't know what they want, but uh, what do I need in really to make my application working? I need to have access to secret A, but I don't want to deal with all the complexity of a co a coding API, a Vault API, or all that kind of stuff. Well, the only thing that I need is, okay, I put my annotation and I say, okay, that's the way it should work. Okay. And Vault and the integration with OpenShift will do the work for, for the developers and will in fact uh, give access to the secrets, inject the secrets, even can create templates and manage templates to, for instance, configure uh, your Java application uh, to connect to a specific database. We can do that with, the, with that specific integration and we'll take in charge the renew and the, uh, and yes, the renew of the token and the renew also of the secrets, you know, for you. You don't have to deal with that anymore. Everything will be taken in charge by, by that specific configuration. So that's, a, you know, a big game changer, I would say for uh, that kind of integration, because as I said earlier, instead of dealing with static secret base, base 64 encoded in your OpenShift, you can share all the secrets with uh, any kind of infrastructure, which is OpenShift or any kind of, uh, of other infrastructure like VMware or whatever. And everything is centralized, audited, and you can control who can access what and which application can access what in terms of, uh, term of secrets. So of course, uh, instead of you know using the integration with Vault and uh, integration with Vault uh, for Kubernetes, we also have and provide uh, you know nat native integration. So that's what I said just before the fact that we have libraries to work with Java, to work with Spring, and when you work with OpenShift, most of the time you work with Spring or Java application, but we have also 
uh, libraries to be integrated na natively with, um, with Python and Go, or even Ruby or C++ or, um, you know, .NET, whatever. We have like uh, every kind of integration. And inside that kind of integration, you can leverage inside your code uh, the fact that you can authenticate still uh, always with the Kubernetes authentication methods and you can grab, you know, the secrets when you start the application. So instead of having an init and a sidecar container, you can write directly inside your codes as a native integration to Vault to retrieve the secrets. So that's two ways of doing things. We can discuss about that between do I need to code specifically my application to support a solution that maybe at some point I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of, for instance, or do I use the integration that I, that I talked earlier with the init and sidecar container? That's a, that's a choice of the customer. But at least if you, have, if you do a lift and shift from the applications that you have on VM and you want to move them on containers without touching code, you can use an, uh, the Vault uh, integration. And if you are coding Greenfield new application, you can use a native one, depends. You can do whatever you want in terms of integration. So now let's talk a little bit about Vault and OpenShift architecture because I saw that we have uh, some uh, question regarding um, what is the best practices? How would you uh, support or deploy Vault uh, when you have an OpenShift you know, uh, infrastructure? So here we have a different recommendation. So let's start with the first one. In our production hardening guide, what we said is Bolt must be the only process, only one process running on the servers. So that's why here we, what we say is, we said it, if you can have a bare metal service, when you can run an OS with the Bolt binary only, nothing else, that will be the best secured way of running Bolt. Why? Because as soon as you put, you know, uh, like a concurrent access to resources or concurrent access to the same machine, you can uh, open some backdoors because, of course, Vault will not be, uh, you can have CVE, for instance, but of course, you have to deal with, okay, uh, the, the patching of the other application running on my servers, uh, the patching of the OS, like always and think about, okay, I open more ports than I needed in for Vault because Vault needs only two ports to be open. And uh, so, you know, that kind of things. So the best recommendation that we can provide is, is if you can, you know, use bare metal or even VMs to deploy Vault outside of OpenShift, that's something that we recommend. Why? Because you have less uh, things to think about in terms of security constraints uh, in regards of Vault. And that works, you know, pretty easy because if you configure as a integration with Vault and OpenShift, the only things that you have to say is uh, when with the L chart is, I want to use an external Vault. That's only things that you have to provide. The external Vault and the uh, IP address or the FQDN, it's better the FQDN of the Vault servers, and that's it. That's enough. You don't have to configure more things uh, on that, okay? So that's, that's pretty easy. Why we have to provide that? It's because when the injector will uh, inject the init and sidecar container, it just needs to know which Vault it has to talk about, okay? So if you think about it, the, webs, the web application use the Vault token, uh, the, the service account uh, token, and go through the, through the external Vault, uh, through, uh, through the <coughs> egress of the OpenShift, connect to it, the Vault will go through the API of Kubernetes, validate the identity, and give them back the, uh, configure, the access to the token uh, to, the <coughs> to the database and uh, create the secrets and finally put the secret in, inside the web machine and the web machine can access directly to the database. Okay, so that's quite easy to configure and that's quite easy you know, to, to maintain in, in the long term. 
Why also? Because for instance, if your OpenShift need maintenance, you need to upgrade your OpenShift cluster, you're gonna kill in fact, or probably have some issue to maintain the SLA on the vault because vault will be used and stored inside the same infrastructure. So you can, you know, decouple the two uh, different infrastructure and relies on different and external services. But, so here, that's already what I said uh, regarding why Vault outside OpenShift is better than Vault inside OpenShift in terms of security, okay? Because we decouple a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> easy to harden, easy to, to maintain. You don't have the same life cycle between Vault and OpenShift and whatever. So it's uh, pretty easy. Of course, you have to, uh, for instance, configure or use an automated process to manage the life cycle of the Vault version. So if it could be Ansible or Perpet or whatever, if you want to use configuration management, or it could be a, a, a coupling uh, between Packer and Terraform if you want to move to the immutable infrastructure, you know, on that kind of platform. But now if you think about, okay, as I said, we can use and we support Vault inside OpenShift. So as a teaser, um, we just released the beta, the beta support of Elm Chart and Vault Enterprise on OpenShift. It will be GA on the version 1.5. Uh, so today we provide the Elm Chart with the OpenShift uh, you know, uh, specification. So that means you can deploy Vault inside OpenShift um, with the Elm Chart, with the supported Elm Chart. But what you have to think about is the thing that first, the first recommendation that we provide is, as possible, please use a dedicated OpenShift cluster. You're saying, mm, okay, that's quite expensive because it's not free to run an OpenShift dedicated cluster just for six pods or five pods because that's the thing that we have with Vault. Or if you use, uh, if you use a multi-tenancy cluster, at least you have to think about uh, using dedicated work no uh, worker nodes. So you have to think about the labels. You have to think about the anti-affinity uh, uh, rules for the pod. You have to think about uh, the taint and the toleration and the fact that only vote can run on that specific worker nodes. And even if someone else tried to run another pod, it will not work because it cannot be uh, used in the scheduler of Q uh, OpenShift to run something else than Vault, okay? But it works, it's supported, that's, uh, that's still secure, of course, and you can even use and expose your Vault through a route to give access, you know, uh, from external services to the Vault inside OpenShift. But what you have to think about, really, when you think about, you know, deploying Vault inside OpenShift is the fact that you have more security constraint because instead of you know, using a VM where you have your specific kernels running in your VMs inside OpenShift, you are sharing the same kernel, okay? You are sharing some calls, you have uh, access, you can have access, you can you know, find a way to have access to the memory of the systems. Uh, even if you use C groups or whatever, you can still have access to it. You always have to, uh, a possibility to have access and to hack the system. So that's why just be careful when you do that. We have a recommendation on learn.hashicorp.com where you have everything related to reference architecture for Vault on Kubernetes or Vault on OpenShift because that's pretty much the same thing. And uh, to answer the question that I saw, if you deploy Vault on OpenShift, of course, HA is supported. Uh, Vault, were, uh, Vault uh, will be um, deployed with uh, Raft integrated storage. That's the only thing that is supported right now on OpenShift because console is not yet certified on OpenShift. And yes, we're gonna use like always, you know, uh, stateful sets, the fact that we need to rely on uh, shared storage because we use uh, Raft and all that kind of stuff. So. That's something that you have to keep in mind. So here, as I said, we have, uh, when, you, when we deploy uh, Vault inside OpenShift, uh, the thing is that we are closer to the cloud native application. Yes, but 
what else? Uh, what, what about the other needs? Like I said, uh, access to chemi, access to, uh, you know, um, static, static or dynamic secrets from uh, VMs, from bare metal servers or whatever. Uh, and, you know, always think about the fact that you have specific uh, security constraints that you have to take into account when you want to deploy Vault on OpenShift. Yep. So here, <clears throat> we had like, we already had like that kind of discussion with why we don't provide a Vault operator for uh, OpenShift, because that's, uh, you know, that's become a standard for at least pushing by Red Hat uh, for, you know, things when you want to work with uh, services uh, or third party services inside OpenShift. So here we had, I would say we did a lot of things. Um, we have the Elm chart, as I said, which, is, uh, which support now OpenShift in a beta, okay? And it will be GA in 1.5. But because now Elm chart is supported in uh, OCP since uh, 4.2, because we use Elm v3 without Tiger and without specific, you know, security uh, breach that was, uh, uh, that comes with uh, Elm v2 uh, version. So now uh, Red Hat supports the, using, the use of Elm and we, that's, why, that's why we provide that. And we are thinking about creating an uh, operator for Vault, but we are still thinking, okay, what we want to achieve really, because mainly what we want to do here is not to create secrets through uh, OpenShift operator. What we want to do is mainly, you know, deploy and upgrade Vault, mainly. That's what we want to achieve because we don't want to give access to anyone to create whatever they want inside, inside the Vault. So if we want, if, if at some point we, we, we release, sorry, an operator, we will um, start with, uh, you know, the basic operation of Vault, which is uh, deploying Vault and managing Vault in terms of, uh, term of uh, life cycle management. And more things are coming uh, with OpenShift. So we are, uh, so for version 1.5, we're gonna release a certified Vault uh, images on the registry, on the Red Hat registry. Uh, and we are, um, you know, providing more, uh, even more integration with OpenShift, even if we are already, you know, pretty good with, with that. And uh, we are, um, yeah, we are, we are good with that. So I, I'm done with uh, integration and we are, you know, happy to answer any questions that you could have. Uh, that you had, I see some questions. Perfect. So yes, we, we've had a few questions come through. Thank you very much um, to Robert and Nicholas for the presentation. Um, so Nicholas, uh, a fairly long question, but a, a good one. Um, how do you recommend an app to access tokens from Vault? So for microservice-based applications, each pod may require that token. But for getting that token, we need a service or an account to access our main token. How do you manage service tokens life cycles? Yes. So here, what, so what we do uh, and what we recommend regarding that. So of course you have to use service account. Okay. So depending on what you want to achieve, but um, for instance, as I said, you have a project and you have, a, you have some pods. Pods are accessing exactly the same secrets, okay? So you are defining a service account on that specific project. And on the Vault side, you are creating um, and configuring a specific role for that specific service account, okay? So you define the airbag on Vault to say, if I use that service account, I have access to that specific role and that specific roles give me access to a subset of specific secrets tied to uh, the application needs, okay, running on that specific project. So if you have more, that maybe you, and that's the case. So if you have more than one project, and that's always the case, you create as much as service accounts that you have 
to uh, that you have to create in regards on the project. And you can also create, and we encourage to create as, ma as many roles as needed on the board side to say, okay, my specific project A need to specific, uh, I need a specific access to a secret A. So I need uh, to create a role project A to say only my project A with that specific service account can access to that specific, uh, to that specific roles, okay? Because I attach a specific policy. And I do the same for project B, C, D, and whatever. In regard of that, we don't manage uh, at the vault level, the rotation of the service account. So that's a service account. If you want to change it, if you want to, uh, to manage it, that's on the OpenShift side. And we don't have a way to automate the creation of the service account from the vault side. But that's the things that we are recommending and using, you know, uh, in using that. Service account, attached to a role and specific role attached to a specific sequence. I hope that answers the question. Awesome, thank you. Um, another one that's come through, does the injector scan for secret updates? Um, so that's not the injector. The injector is only there to uh, inject the, the init and the sidecar uh, and the configuration of that specific sidecar, but the sidecar itself, so not the init, as uh, the init container, as an init container, it's just running at the beginning of the creation of the pods, and after that it will be killed, okay? But the sidecar container is a long lived container, you know, uh, beside the pods, and if uh, you change something, or even if you have a configure a TTL, on a specific secrets. If it is KV, for instance, you put a TTL on a KV. So the agent running in the sidecar container will, uh, before the end of the TTL, will uh, check and retrieve the new version of the secrets. Okay, so the agent will deal with that. The sidecar container is in charge of that, not the injector. Okay, perfect. And the last question that we've got, um, does the Vault integration work with both OpenShift Platform 3 and 4? Um, that's a good question. Mm. So as I said earlier, uh, you can deploy Vault uh, in version 3, 3.11, uh, 3 because that's the last version that is still supported by Red Hat. So if you do that on 3.9, 3.6, 3.8, it's not even supported by Red Hat. So, so you have to at least work with 3.11. So yes, it works. It is supported not by not with you, not when you want to use Elm chart, because as I said, Elm chart before uh, before 4.2 was not supported. So you have to install it manually. So we can do that. It's possible. Yes. Uh, but it's easier to deploy it outside OpenShift because, as I said, if you use a 3.x version of OpenShift, at some point you have to upgrade that version to a 4. something. And sometimes the upgrades could be, uh, you know, um, could create, like I would say, uh, disruptive upgrades. Okay. So it's always better if you don't want to have to deal with uh, different support. You say, okay. Just put Bolt outside OpenShift and it will be supported for sure. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think that's about all the questions that we've had. Um, so everyone, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make that recording available on our website after it's been processed. And I'll send the link via email to you as well. As Nicholas mentioned earlier, if you would like to check out what you heard today and start exploring Vault, then I really encourage you to check out our new Learn site. You can find that at learn.hashicorp.com forward slash Vault. Last but not least, we also have HashiConf Digital coming up on the 22nd and 24th of June. Now, that would be a great opportunity to hear from our founders who will be talking about the latest product updates, 
but we'll also be running a number of virtual technical and hands-on learning sessions to really help you make the most of the HashiCorp toolset. I'll add a link in the follow-up email as well. So with that, I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar and thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.